Galway, 1833. A wandering peddler approaches the mayor and tells him that local butcher, James Hughes, is in fact a wanted murderer named Bernard McCann. Hughes denies the charge and is detained under suspicion of murder. Who was Bernard McCann and did an innocent man hang for his crime? In July 1813, Bernard McCann quit his job as a baker in a fit of spite when his boss refused to give him time off to attend the Maze Horse Racing Festival. The Maze Races were a very popular horse race with thousands attending each year. The gentry were there, and the strong farmers, the weavers from the valley, the tradesmen, the vendors of pies, crew beans, and dulse, the ballad singers, trick of the loop men, apprentices, farriers, and many other assorted characters, honest or shady. In a statement at the murder trial, one witness would state, The maze races bring many villainous fellows from all arts and parts. The wise man shows no curiosity in them. At the festival, McCann crossed paths with Owen McAdam, a horse dealer. It's possible they knew each other previously, but regardless, the two would be seen together often over the course of the festival. On the 25th of July, they had breakfast together. Evidently, McAdam had had some success selling horses, as he had a wad of banknotes, as well as a piece of ginger. The ginger is part of an old horse dealer trick, feeging or gingering. Essentially, if you stick a piece of ginger under a horse's tail, they get agitated and jump around, seeming stronger and younger than they actually are. It's a scam to get people to buy elderly horses as if they were younger. They were briefly joined by Toby Boyce, a tramp of indefinite age and occupation. Unfortunately, tempers frayed in a fight broke out between McCann and Boyce, only ending when McAdam gave Boyce a florin to leave. As McCann and McAdam ate, McCann stated he planned to try to get his job back. There was, again, some brief tension between the two over money, but it seemed to pass. McAdam had earned an estimate of £70 for his day's work, but McCann was stuck with the dinner bill after losing a bet. After this, McAdam tried and failed to sell the distinctive grey colt to one John Chambers. While they were haggling, McAdam checked the time on his watch, a very distinct piece with four soldiers painted on the face. When they failed to make a deal, they called to a pub in Lisburn and left the colt there. They would later return to the bar to get the horse and have a final few drinks. A third man accompanied them, but did not enter. McAdam was clearly drunk, but McCann barely touched his drink and even forced a second drink on McAdam. McAdam would not be seen alive again. The next morning, the 26th of July, a body was fished out of the canal. According to local physician, Sir George Atkinson, he had been struck from behind, strangled, and thrown in the river to drown. His pockets were empty, except for a piece of ginger. At the inquest, multiple people confirmed they had seen the dead man with Bernard McCann. McCann was charged with willful murder, and the search began. McCann was described as well-dressed, with fair hair and a pale complexion with smallpox marks. The body was placed on display in the church in the hope he would be identified. He was definitively identified as McAdam by John Dawson, or possibly by Toby Boyce, according to another source. It may have been both of them. McAdam was interred in the graveyard on the 30th. This was a minor problem, as his family showed up shortly after to claim his body. It seems that nobody had reached out to them prior to the funeral. I'm not sure how that happened, but it did. There was again a minor scuffle over the body, but eventually his father and brother took him home. Before leaving, the younger brother paid a visit to the local pier at the Marquis of Downshire. The Marquis promised to find the murderer and gifted him a few guineas for the trouble he and his father had gone through. Where was McCann while all this was going on? A few hours before McAdams was found on the 26th, two men with a grey horse called to the Red Cow Inn for breakfast. They attempted to sell the horse to the owner, William Mills, for a guinea, which is roughly one euro, one pound sterling, one dollar today. Suspicious of the low price, Mills refused. Later that day, Mills heard of the murder and realized one of the men fit the description of McCann, but they were long gone by then. Later still than that day, James Vance would claim a man fitting McCann's description stopped to buy a month's grazing for his grey horse that same day. They agreed a price, and the man paid a deposit, promising to return. Before he left, he asked if Vance was interested in buying a watch. The watch in question had soldiers painted on the face. 
there would be no further sightings of McCann or his mysterious companion. It would take 10 years, but eventually charges for the murder would be laid against James Hughes, a prosperous butcher in Galway. Hughes was 29 years old, married with five children, and owned 28 acres of land. Hughes denied being McCann and all the accusations against him. Accusations made by none other than the wandering tramp, Toby Boyce. Hughes was imprisoned, and the questioning continued. Hughes claimed to be from Dungannon, in County Tyrone. One of the men questioning him, James Riley, knew the town and asked if he knew the Knox family. Hughes claimed to know a Hugh Knox. According to Riley, there was no Hugh Knox. Hardly a smoking gun, but this and other evidence was enough to get Hughes transferred to Downpatrick, where he was questioned by Magistrate Hugh Moore and the Marquis of Downshire. His story was quickly picked apart. He had no knowledge of Dungannon, the townlands near it, or any people living there. There was no record of a Hughes family there. The few names he could offer, an incaper named Reed, and a Catholic and Protestant priest, Mar and Gill, also did not exist. Finally, he went to trial on July 29, 1823, shortly after the 10th anniversary of the murder. All the original witnesses were still alive and gave damning testimony. No one could prove James Hughes even existed, but some, not all, stated that the man before them was Bernard McCann. Toby Boyce had to be removed from the court after a bizarre outburst. Of course it's him! Of course it's Bernie McCann! Forget them eyes, with the murder peeping out of them? No, ho ho, you damned ruffian. You're in the right place now. The rope's been in the making for ye these past ten years. After an hour of deliberation, the jury returned the verdict. Guilty. But, in view of the subsequent good conduct of the prisoner, we would recommend him to mercy. Judge Moore replied, Under the circumstances of the case, your recommendation can have no effect. Hughes took to the stand to hear a sentence. Judge Moore admonished him, Do not, by denial, make your condition more miserable than it is. Do not further taunt your God by appeals of your innocence. Do not, I beseech you, lay the flattering and dangerous unction to your soul that there is a shadow of hope that the sentence of the law will not be carried into effect. Little now remains of my painful duty but to pass upon you, Bernard McCann, the awful sentence of the law. You shall be removed from where you stand, to the place from whence you came, a common jail. They are heavily ironed until the day of your execution. You shall then have your irons struck off and be taken to the place where criminals are usually executed, and they are hanged by the neck until you are dead. And may the eternal and omnipotent God have mercy on your soul. Two days later, the 31st of July, 1823, Hughes amid the scaffolding outside Don Patrick Jail. There, he finally admitted he was McCann and asked forgiveness for his crime. Unfortunately, it was not to end with that. When the executioner pulled the lever, the trap door opened, and James Hughes, or Bernard McCann, dropped and kept falling. The rope snapped, and he slammed into the ground. He was carried back into the prison to recover, and spent an hour and a half sitting in his own coffin, before calmly returning to the scaffold. The second time, there were no mistakes. I have no doubt McCann was involved in the murder of McAdam. What interests me about this case is that they never definitively proved James Hughes was McCann. They proved Hughes was lying about who he was, but there are many reasons to lie or hide your identity, especially when you're in prison in Ireland under English rule. His admission on the scaffold does seem to put that to rest. But we have no idea what happened in the two days between sentencing and execution. The Marquis does seem to have been a decent sort, but 
he made a promise to see justice done. Did he order the courts in prison to get a result, regardless of guilt? Was she was simply tortured and tutored on what to say? And then who was the third man? Two witnesses saw a third man with McAdam and McCann that night and morning. We can assume the second sighting was after the murder, since it was just the two of them at the bar for breakfast. Was this third man Boyce? Or was it someone else? McAdam was also a scam artist, gingering or feeding his horse to get a better price. This is a very far cry from murder, but he was no angel. Could that have been a factor? Could someone else who had paid too much for some nag come out from angry? McCann fled the scene. We also know that Boyce was very excited to see Hughes hang. Very enthusiastic about that. Was it honest joy at seeing justice finally be done? Or was there something more to it? We know there was bad blood between McCann and Boyce. They had a fight. Was that a factor? We will never know what truly happened that night. Who that third man was, or where he disappeared to. What we do know is that the dead have names. One may even have had two. John McAdam. Bernard McCann. James Hughes. 